I am from Survivor, but you know, way before then, I grew up in Kokomo, Indiana. Yeah. All of you guys that do not know uh, much about me, you're going to hear very quickly because I hear we only got about 25 minutes in. You guys are going to go to Grew up in Kokomo, Indiana. Went to Midcrest Elementary and Hayward High School. Uh, I was one of those guys that if they didn't have the industrial <coughs> hall down the hallway, I probably wouldn't have made it through high school. I did not like school. My dad taught at IU. He was the uh, uh, professor of, of geology at an IU, and my mom taught chemistry and biology. I was tired of teachers. I didn't want teachers anymore. I got out of high school and get away from people. The teachers. Uh, like you say, industrial hallway, metal shop, wood shop, workshop, um, sewing, cooking, uh, life skills, checkbooks, balancing your checkbooks, budgeting. We used to teach that in high school. Well, if I didn't learn how to use a sewing machine in high school, I wouldn't have been able to sew my dress and survive. <laughs> high school education helped me in uh, reality TV. Uh, Graduated a uh, semester early, yeah, in January of 82, and by the summertime I was in Abilene, Texas. Kokomo in the 80s, the early 80s, had 15% uh, unemployment. It was just outrageous. We were going through a giant uh, uh, stranglehold with OPEC holding our, holding, not our oil. <laughs> <laughs> And we were paying a bucket and a half a gallon of gas and thinking that was terrible. Up from, 30, uh, up from 37 oh. cents in 1976. Exactly right. Yeah. Tripled, tripled was, five years. It was bad. Uh, Avenue, Texas had the lowest unemployment rate in the nation. 3% unemployment and people who were working for $8 an hour. I found it on the map, loaded my Chevy Chevette up and moved there within a week. I was there. Started working in the oil field, it went down by about 83. I was struggling, I was aroused about doing just got off of work, but I was working. Abilene had a giant institution, the uh, Abilene State School. They still have the giant uh, metal facilities, the giant institutions with thousands of patients. Uh, I applied and started working there. I found a home, I, I loved it. The mental health field, I love. I could fit on either side. <laughs> <laughs> I love being a care provider and giving people that ability to have a good life and a good day. But I also understood the crazy side. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a very simple world, and I appreciate it. I uh, worked there in, all through the 80s. Left there in 1990. I watched our federal and state government get so wrapped up in lawsuits and documentation and covering your ass that in the early 80s they would go through, we had giant bays, uh, 24 guys and 24 girls, all in big open bays, half fall, so you could see everybody, they're all bedridden, they're all non-ambulatory, they're all profoundly, terminally, they're the last stop before they die dorm. It was pleasantly called the death dorm. And I loved it. Um, before I came, the people laid in bed and waited to die. After I got there, we started getting them up, getting them dressed, taking them out. I got my bus certification. We started giving people a life. They cared about the clients in the early 80s. By the mid-80s, the inspectors would come in and our clients, you know, they would talk to one or two and then ask where your charts are and sit for days and go through the charts and dig through the charts and find everything that was not crossed or dotted and make sure you went back and did that and beat you up for it because they were training you how to document whether it happened or not. <coughs> By the late 80s, they came in, looked at our clients and said, where's your charts? They used to spend weeks talking to each individual. Nine, nine years went by, and they went from caring about the clients to caring about the documentation. And I knew I had to go. I uh, moved back to Indianapolis, and it was taking care of my adoptive grandparents. Uh, lived with them in Rod Ripple. 
took care of them during the day, and it worked at night. I was working bouncing in the bar in the alley cap. That's a good bar. It is a good bar. <laughs> back, um, back, there. back in the day when half of Broad Ripple was boarded up, it was a quiet little neighborhood bar. It was nice. It's gotten a little more popular now. Um, but my grandparents had passed within, my grandfather within uh, the first year that I was back, my grandmother about six months after him. They have been together for almost 50 years. I'm going to live long with that guy. Uh, struggling, didn't know what to do. I had left Abilene, Texas with two credits to go in my nursing degree, but a prolonged sickness took the money away that I was going to use to finish school. I uh, was working at the bar and kind of bouncing around, ended up the money for medical bills, where in this country medical bills can bankrupt you. Uh, took everything, every penny, penny that we had, and I was uh, at night looking for people that I could go crash on a couch. Ended up finding a young lady that I, I uh, stayed with and rented a room off of, and she had a young boy, 14 years old, that did not like school. But there wasn't the industrial arts anymore. Um, it was just school. All she had to do, to do was look at the teacher, cuss them out, say, I'll kill you. <laughs> the teacher walks over to the panic button, pushes the panic button, security shows up, the boy's out of school. Doesn't have to report in, doesn't have to do anything. Has a verbal assault and is now on, uh, in 91, is on the probation records, but not really having to do anything, because that's kind of the limbo that we were putting kids in. Uh, a couple months later, a couple more of his kids show up at the house. Now I've got to work all night, and they're there all day. <laughs> I ended up talking to his mother, and we started the program that I've been running for 20 years because I saw the need there. We created Kids Hope, Kids Helping Other People. Uh, we took kids that were that as young as 12 years old, uh, they were not making it in, in education, and taught them vocation. If you were being put out of school because of learning disabled, emotionally handicapped, uh, uh, all the different all the different categories that they, the public education uses to put our kids out, because they're graded now on a standardized test that is just terrible. But we'll talk about that after. Um, we created a work program that I would go out and do rehab on houses. I would do bathroom remodels, kitchen remodels, different remodels, and I would take these guys and make you be a worker and pay you five bucks an hour a stipend. Not a paycheck, because you really want to work it, but a stipend. We ran that for many, many years. Uh, the dog project showed up in the late 90s. Federal money and state money started getting thrown at programs. We said no, always. We said no. We don't want to have the government in our pocket saying you can't keep this person, you can't and can't keep these people, you can't, you have to do this. We didn't want that. I want to be able to run a program that if you take six months or six years in our program, you have that time. There's no restrictions. Um, the Dawn Project came in, Choices came in, the Rainbow Coalition, different programs came into town and started, set up shop, and spent millions and millions and millions of dollars. They came to me. I've been running a program out of Hamilton County and Marion County for years. The Dawn Project came to me with some of their last stoppers, their third strikers, the worst of the worst, the violent, aggressive, the predators, the ones that there were no other programs for, and I would take them and put them in our program. We had, from the Dawn Project, there were 38 young men that we had, worst of the worst. Uh, the South African government came in and did tracking on our program after I was in Survivor. From 97 to 2002, I had 38 bond kids that we had the whole life history on. Second, third, fourth generation of doing the same thing. From 2003 to 2005, the South African government did research, tracked every name, pulled every arrest record, saw that only two of the 38 kids had even been arrested in that three-year period. 
brought my wife and daughter and I out to South Africa to help create the empowerment program that's still running outside of Johannesburg from the program we're doing here because they've never seen so much results, especially with no government dollars. We don't take a government dollar. The dollars that we used to run our program were the dollars we, used, we earned work creating programs out of entitlement programs that are self-sustaining empowerment programs. Teaching somebody that has just done this and get mad at you when you stop giving them money. Teaching them to pull that hand back and take care of themselves. Read and write. Learn how to make a legal living. Learn how to have the social skills so you can go through the application and then get the job. And once you do, show the employer you've got some value. That's how our program has worked for 20 years. We've now outlasted the Dawn Project, outlasted Choices, outlasted A and the Homeless Coalition that worked so hard for so, so many families, but tied themselves to government dollars. And as soon as government dollars were gone, services stopped that day. Um, we're still here. I've been running 20 years. I'm hopefully going to run another 20, 30, 40, 50 years. My daughter will tell you, I named the parent company RFB, Rupert Frederick Bonham Enterprises. I've also, in, in this time, created Tournament Towers, a trucking company. It's a multi-million dollar trucking company. It does TV productions. I've got four crews out on the road right now doing college sports, college uh, football. Getting ready to do the BCS bowl games and all the bowl games. Uh, in January, we do indie racing. We do a lot of other TV stuff and entertainment stuff to help fund our program, our mentoring program. Because we take profits out of that and give it over to our kids. Uh, we've ran now 20 years. We've been the last six years working directly with the city. Uh, doing 30 city parks, hundreds of acres of weed eating, mowing, trash cleanup, landscaping. Uh, the Christmas tree mulch for six years. This will be our sixth year. We launched Christmas trees from December 27th to February the 1st or 2nd. Every day we're mulching grand out Christmas trees, putting those in piles, seasoning them for a year, and giving them away to the neighborhoods. All for free. Um, we do a spring cleanup in a fall plant. It's only been the last few years that we've even accepted any money from the parks program because in 08, when I thought for sure in November and December we would get some donations, year-end donations. We had for every year, year after year. Uh, even before Survivor, we were getting donations at the end of the year from different companies. 50 bucks, 100 bucks, 1,000 bucks, year-end stuff. 08, no year-end. 09, no donations. A few corporate donations, but private sector was drying up. We went to the parks program and said, we need to at least offset a little bit of our costs because I've got 10, 12, 14 guys out working at minimum wage. That's about the time they bumped up minimum wage. That's also the time a few years earlier that they came in and said, even though your kids are unemployable, even though your kids can't read and write, even though there's nowhere else your kids would work. You're a work program. You're not an educational program anymore. And the government told me I will spend my money paying uh, unemployment benefits, paying uh, welfare, food, uh, paying uh, 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 workman's comp, paying social security, paying and doing reductions on all of them. Now, that's the government coming in. This is a year after the IRS already came in and cleared all my and he came back six months later and said, oh, clerical error. He gave me half of it back. <laughs> illegally took my money, illegally kept it, and then gave it back with no real explanation other than, not even, I'm sorry. And then the next year says, there's been more money because we see too much money going through your program and we want some. <laughs> Instead of helping our program. So we've been dealing with that for years and years. A couple years ago, I started thinking, instead of being one that is kind of separating myself 
from the government programs. How about let's be one of those that actually leads those government programs? And I start talking to my wife. I start thinking about it more and more. And I start talking to the libertarians. And I decided that I think it would be a good thing to run for government, to be able to stand up and say, this is what I've been, this is what I've done, this is who I am for the last 47 years. I'll be that governor that will stand up and say, if it's for the good of our state, okay, if it's, you're just talking about the good for myself, for the upper echelon for corporate America. Um, I want to be the governor that is known as the one that walks in, still struggling, paying my bills, and I walk out, still, just like everybody else. Struggling to pay our bills because all we really need is to be able to take care of ourselves. These people that are generating thousands, millions of dollars and walking out of office, these people that are going into office just to become one of the insiders in Washington, and dug ourselves <coughs> you guys going to dig us out of? I talked to a lot of them 40, 50 year olds that are starting to age out. Most of my volunteer list on my mentoring program, most of our volunteers and our libertarians are those 18, 19, 20, 22, 24 year olds. Not the 40, 50 year olds. Thanks, uh, Rupert. I want to. <laughs> <laughs> we are, as, as those of us that are creeping up on 50 years old, I still feel like I'm 20 and I still want to give to our community. But a lot of us that are that old, we're too set in our ways to give. You guys got to teach them how. Um, there's only a few minutes, so I want to have some time to ask questions. If anybody's got any questions, I am that non-politician that is running for major political office. There's got to be some questions. Yes, yes. As governor, uh, what changes would you make to our state fiscal policy? You know, with the, in, across the board, <coughs> One of the things I like saying is going back eight years and looking at just the administration, just the, the, the spending that we've got. Um, when we come in so much with uh, the oversight in our programs, I want to come in and start cutting administration and cutting programs, but from the top down. I want to start decentralizing government and giving back the communities the ability to govern themselves. Just like the state is way better at governing our state than the federal government is, the community is better governing than the state. Bringing back some of the uh, community back to our government. Eliminating that uh, elitist that attitude of the government and showing how the government was created to be our employees, not our ruler. There's, I don't really know how to answer that question exactly because it's so broad. <laughs> and uh, I'm looking at Chris because I'm terrible at it's going on and on and on. <laughs> I, I can give you 20 minutes. Um, would, you, would you consider cutting taxes across the board 10% Saturday? The first thing that we're going to do is in the, with the tax dollars that we spend first, you, we don't have to increase at any. Downing the correctional facilities, downing the administration, downing the oversight of some of the programs will free up so much money that in that first year we will have so much behind us in surplus that I can get the Democrats and the Republicans to both, both agree on a tax cut. But first so that would be, I a, have to, would be a goal for yours? That would be most definitely a goal. First I have to... The two sides that we have, we don't want a, a, a hooky situation happening again this year. We don't want, we want the Democrats and the Republicans to actually work together. We want them to see that the Libertarians have a, a good answer for a lot of problems. But we've got to come up with dollars first to show how we're going to pay with this. There's a lot of, there's millions of extra dollars in our... Billions, actually. Facilities. Billions. There's billions of extra dollars. If we start eliminating from the top down, it's in these programs. Yes, sir.
what is your <clears throat> opinion on the recent uh, Supreme, Indiana Supreme Court uh, about the language of our Constitution that allows us essentially cops to in our, our, break into your house without any preparation? To, to walk all over our Fourth Amendment? <coughs> to, in, our, in my program, I deal with a lot of people that are second, third, fourth generation of breaking off, no matter what they're doing, breaking off. When you have somebody like that in a neighborhood that you know that their grandparents are doing something and you see a boy out on the street or a girl out on the street and you know that's their kid, I'm going to follow you home and walk in on you and say, I have probable cause, and kick in your door and walk in and break every law in the world that anyone else <coughs> would be held accountable to except our government make the government stand up to the same laws that we have to abide by. Um, there's no way I would ever condone uh, letting an officer in your house without a search warrant, uh, without just cause. If there is a domestic uh, dispute going on inside that there that was, was called, there's, that's the big issue right now is if somebody is in danger inside the house. If there is a dangerous situation, that's one thing. But a police officer having an attitude and saying, I'm coming in your house is illegal and should never happen. I think, I think the, 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 the ruling agreed. It just said if you tried to stop them, you're getting arrested. Well, they gentled it up. Right. You still cannot uh, uh, resist. And whether the policeman is right or wrong, if you resist, you're, you're, it's bad. Yeah. Um, They've gentled up the language, but it doesn't. It's still the same thing. They can come in your house. We need to repeat that. Yes. Recently, Purdue, <coughs> at Purdue, we, uh, there are, there's a large group of us, there's a large coalition that is trying to push uh, student government legislation to recommend Purdue allow uh, students to uh, conceal carry on campus. Um, it was ultimately defeated, but uh, what what are your thoughts on a on a state level initiative to uh, you know the uh, the second amendment, second amendment talking about your right to bear arms uh, different interpretations of that all the way to defend yourself against our government and um, but to protect yourself if this if you have a if you have a permit and you're illegal to carry your gun, then you're legal to carry your gun. Now, I'm not crazy about somebody walking in and sitting down with a sidearm sitting next to me, you know, because I know that a lot of people are shot with their own weapons. A lot of people are. Usually cops. <laughs> <laughs> they are! <laughs> um, but, you know, it's our right to, bear, to, to carry bear arms, to have arms, to protect yourself. Um, so I can't say that I would, I would have to support being able to carry your guns onto campus, being able to carry your gun. Now, any place where you're serving boozers, I would hope that you would leave your gun at home. You know, there's a big, big talk about bringing your gun into Conceco or into the Hoosier Dome. But that's a, private, that's a private area. And the same way that if your teacher doesn't want guns in the classroom, I suppose they could put a metal detector at their door. That's their classroom. It's not their classroom. It's the, it's the, state, it's the state's, state's classroom. Property. Yeah, it's not their classroom. It would be that's yeah. you know. I mean, like if uh, guns on campus is a big debate. I would I would stand up and say you can <coughs> you can carry your gun on campus. Yeah, I'm not I'm not talking about like Wabash or a private institution. Just but state facilities. State facilities. Right. Just state facilities. So you support people being able to carry arms. We don't support the idea of open carry. Which, right now, at the moment, you don't have to have license for. Mm -hmm. Which is why um, we basically carry on and get out of the Right. Okay. I, see, I come from a world where people walk around thinking about taking guns off people and using them against them. Okay. So I see a different world than a lot of other people see. I'm just saying I have a lot of friends who do that. Local, local carry business, cheaper than mine. 
Well, and, and you know, I, well, owns, owns well, let's correct workshop. something here. There's no law that allows you to open carry uh, pistol. You have to, you have, to have a it, carry per permit to a, transport uh, a pistol right. other than to and from a range. You have to have a permit uh, okay. to carry it in public. There, there. I agree with you, sure? however, though. You're, 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 you're pushing in the monkey by open carry. I've been in those situations as well. It doesn't private property also, private property versus state property and public spaces right. also have a lot to do with this as far as the owners of businesses and private, you know. Exactly right. It's a state facility that we all pay, pay for and we all run, of course. Anybody should be able to carry the gun. Um, uh, private, uh, my, my ball. Responsibility, overall side of the state, gun rights, things like this. You seem to have a real, you know, frankly, you remind me a lot of a lot of liberals. Who, the things that you hold near and dear to your heart have to do with people who might be considered marginalized. Right. How do you reconcile a position that's a little alien to libertarians uh, uh, with more of the mainstream libertarian thinking? Uh, my bringing to light the 44% of our budget going to the public schools, the, 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 the 18% going to the uh, mental world, the, the money that we are spending on our social side to, to entitlement programs. If I could turn some of that around, if I could show some of our dollars spent in a better way and free up millions and millions of dollars to work on the economic side, to make the playing field a little more fair. When I stop giving the big companies the abatements, I need to have money to offset that. Because the libertarian philosophy of making that level playing field, but we have to really still think about bringing big business into Indiana and making it uh, fiscally uh, appealing to them without giving too much away. I don't, I don't like giving abatements to things away. I, I am very much more aware of the personal side than, than the economic side in our government. But the personal side hits me a little more close to home, even though I have been on the economic side with my businesses for years. But the personal side, there's so many billions of dollars. $648 million Marion County spent locking our problems up last year. That's just our county. And that's that would have, would have been over a billion, but we didn't show a lot of the administration. Bringing up a, a few hundred million of that, <clears throat> much back on the economic side and creating the creation of a better work environment. I know that the social programs cost so much with what our economic world is. We just don't see that, and we've always been so focused on the economic side that we forget about these people. I I tell people all the time. The bottom 20% of our system costs us 50% of our dollars. We have to deal with that bottom 20% and it will free up an amazing amount of money. Yes, sir. The police said we have a problem with the Indiana State Excise Police and breaking our civil liberties with regards to uh, the substances we choose to, the fluids we choose to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Liquor. <laughs> if, if, uh, like the governor, we support the reduced presence of the Indiana State Excise Police on the uh, Indiana State College. Shut them down. Um, the Excise Police. <laughs> Uh, another group that feel like they have so much power that they can almost, uh, well, they step all over your, your rights. They, they walk in and they, I would say that I know the excise, Indiana excise, um, could be downsized considerably and still be able to keep control and make sure that we are following the letter of the law. Uh, the, the one thing that I do know about the libertarian philosophy, instead of planning on somebody breaking the law, give them the ability and the freedom to choose if they do or do not want to break the law, and then if they do break the law, punish them then. But do not try and uh, Uh, do 
do not try and don't overstep your bounds again with the fourth amendment right don't overstep your bounds thinking you're doing your job when you're just stepping on right. somebody's rights and you're going in uh, to frat fraternities and private places um, without warrant and without just cause to do illegal searches to see if there's alcohol on the premises or if there's open containers after hours or if we have to be able to, if we're going to eliminate dollar uh, orders across the board, we have to downsize every government program and give ourselves back the ability to have our own moral compass. It's not the government to tell us our moral compass. Yes, Last question. If anybody else wants to ask a question real quick, you guys can. Thanks, Jeremy. What's your opinion on the end of the Fed? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're done. Just kidding. James. Oh, uh, state nullification. If you were elected governor, would you be a proponent of state nullification of laws such as the health care mandate? One hundred percent. We've already started some policies now. It's going to be closer to the election when we start writing okay. some of the law, some of the things that we would nullify. Um, looking at the farmers, the Indiana farmers, and some of the things that they're doing with them and nullifying some of the laws in a second. Um, looking at some of the, if we have to, with the nonviolent victimless crimes, um, putting, putting a drug, drug addict or an alcoholic in jail and turning them into a violent criminal is insane. $50,000 a year to lock somebody up and teach them how to be a criminal, you could send them to great, you could send them to college. <laughs> I would stand up in a heartbeat and nullify uh, a few of our laws. There are, and if, you know, if you want to talk to me on an individual basis, you can talk to me more about which laws we need to do. Are you there's, there's a guy in uh, the House that, or I think the State Senate, who always brings up that legislation to make gold legal tender. If you were governor, it's a good ally, right? He's in the Senate. His name's Greg Walker. Yeah, exactly. And the, what he's presenting is what I wrote for him. That's awesome. That is, that's awesome. So don't talk smack about it. I'm not talking smack about it. I swear to God, I saw that on the computer and I was like, that can't be true. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Chris isn't here, that means that they packed everything.